Hello family, today I'm going to share with you why many non-SDAs attack the SDA church and label God's church as a cult. But before we do that, friends, this non-Adventist woman actually realized that many non-Adventists have labeled the SDA church falsely. So she made this video in response or in defense of the SDA church telling all non adventists that the SDA church is not and cannot be a cult. The popular podcast with married couple Preston and Jackie Hill Perry have done a couple of episodes now with a Dr. Eric Mason. They are making suggestions, actually, scratch that. They are asking the question, scratch that too. They are outright accusing the Seventh day Adventist church of being a cult. They are not mincing their words. They are making very bold statements against SDAs. And this, of course, has caused lots of uproar within the SDA community. If you didn't know, Preston Perry and his wife, Jackie Hill Perry, are best known for being poets from the well-known Passion for Christ Ministries. Here's a picture of me posing with them in London. Dr. Eric Mason is best known as a founder and senior pastor of a church called Epiphany Fellowship. All three are authors, have huge followings on socials and are very well known in the black Christian community. Okay, so the statement they are making is that SDAs are a cult. That's not very nice, is it guys? Quote from Wikipedia. A cult is a group which is typically led by a charismatic and self-appointed leader. Could Jesus be classified as self-appointed? Who tightly controls its members, requiring unwavering devotion to a set of beliefs and practices which are considered deviant outside the norms of society. Jesus says they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. So definitely considered outside norms of society. So far, Christianity as a whole is looking like a cult, if we're going with the definition, to be honest. Now, when you continue reading what a cult is on Wikipedia, it says it can be defined by its unusual religious, spiritual or philosophical beliefs and rituals, or its common interest in a particular person object or goal so I'm not completely naive as to where they're going with it unusual beliefs a common interest in a particular person all Protestant denominations have slightly different beliefs otherwise there would be no need for different denominations would there but in terms of Christianity as a whole the SDAs have some beliefs that the rest of mainstream Christendom don't have for example they observe the seventh day Sabbath they believe that Jesus second coming won't be a secret rapture but will be visible to all they don't believe that you go straight to heaven when you die but that you rest in peace and you sleep until Jesus returns etc etc so different yes unorthodox maybe but everything they believe is found in scripture as in the bible they're not believing that we were once aliens which is a non-biblical belief they are interpreting what the Bible says literally now I guess you could argue that the cult leader Jim Jones and his church based their religion on the bible the people's temple which is what he called it lasted about 20 or so years and jim jones and a member of his inner circle planned and orchestrated a mass murder suicide so if we're making comparisons as to what a cult looks like i wouldn't say that a worldwide organization which started in the 1800s as part of the reformation movement with a baptized membership of over 22 million people, a missionary presence in over 215 countries and territories who operate over 7,000 schools, numerous hospitals and a humanitarian aid organization is even in the same category as a cult. It's not surprising that SDAs are offended. Yes, they believe that Ellen White was a prophet and follow her writings, but I've seen many prophets pop up within Christianity just check YouTube. Seems like anyone can call themselves prophet or prophetess these days, sharing their prophetic messages from God online. So the fact that SDAs believe a certain person to be a prophet isn't too unusual, is it? The Bible lets us know how we distinguish between false and real prophets, false and real doctrines. Ellen White's writings very much point to Jesus the Messiah 
I mean, it's not a salvational issue. You believe she's a prophet or you don't. As long as SDAs believe in salvation through Jesus alone, then it doesn't really matter. Anywho, if you're here and you're wondering if SDAs are a cult and want to know more about their beliefs, they do have an official website which will let you know that they unequivocally believe that Jesus is God and righteousness and justification comes from him and him alone. Despite the false claims that you might see on the Perry's Instagram page, which says SDAs don't believe that Christ is fully God. I think they're going to regret getting in Reverend Thunder as a guest speaker. He left the SDA church because he clearly has the wrong understanding. It makes sense that he would leave if that's what he's understood to be true. It's just not true. That's the problem. But check out this video. I don't know these guys, but they break it down in detail, all of the points raised on the Perry's podcast, and they say it much better than I could, or a disgruntled, clearly confused ex-SDA member could. I think people who tarnish everyone with the same brush should be careful. Of course there are SDAs who will have extreme beliefs and practices, some which may even go against what the denomination as a whole believes. But then, so does every Christian denomination. You even have some Christian pastors preaching from the book of Enoch in their sermons. Slight dig to Eric Mason there. There probably are some SDAs who put the writings of Ellen White above the writings of Jesus. And of course they shouldn't, but they are the exception, not the rule. If you come against a faith movement or religion, you have to remember that there are individuals who make up that religion. I don't agree with many of the Catholic beliefs, but I wouldn't be so brazen as to jump on the video and start cutting off all Catholics. I have Catholic friends and people that I've worked with. I wouldn't want to offend and upset them. What if God wants to use me to introduce those Catholics to the truth about what the word says? Plus, if I was to shout them down saying all Catholics put Mary above Jesus, well, that wouldn't be accurate, would it? Some Catholics do put Mary above Jesus, but not all of them do. I wonder what the reason was behind the decision to air this conversation. Perhaps it was a marketing strategy. Preston Perry and Dr. Mason both have apologetics books on sale, so perhaps it was to draw attention to that? Sell some books? Although I think they might have misunderstood what apologetics is. It's supposed to be defending your beliefs, not attacking others' beliefs. I'm speculating because I really don't get it. Their conduct as Christians was shocking to me. This wasn't a, hmm, isn't this interesting what these guys believe type conversation. No, this was an outright attack. They were mocking, discrediting, accusing and disrespecting the Adventist church and their interpretation of scripture. Like my title says, they're waging war. But why? Who was this video for? Was it for SDAs to let them know they've got it all wrong? If you as a Christian truly believe that SDAs or any other religion are in error about what they believe, is this the way you should address it? Is this kind of conversation going to bring some enlightenment for them? Is it going to lead them to the truth? That clearly wasn't the goal here. So was it for non-SDAs then to tell them to stay away from the SDA cult in case they get you? There was a recent mass baptism of 300,000 baptized into the Adventist church reported by CBN. They obviously don't think they're a cult. Perhaps this was the first of a series of videos in which they're going to cuss out every single faith which is different to theirs. Who's next, I wonder? Jehovah Witness? Muslims? Here's a question. What should our response be to people who believe differently to us? Do we call them out as heretics? Do we take an us versus them stance? Do we wage war and make them our enemies? Ridicule them and point out the error of their ways? Perhaps you think this is the response we should have as Christians. Perhaps freedom of choice and freedom of religion is really getting phased out. It's this kind of division that's caused wars, persecution, hate crimes, even if we do see other faiths as our enemies or an enemy of God and his truth. The Bible tells us we should love our enemies. Why does God say that? Because those individuals who have different beliefs, they're still God's children. God loves them. Jesus came and died for those SDAs and those Jehovah Witnesses and those Muslims, even those atheists. Even if they have got it wrong, really wrong, he still loves them. He still died for them. Yes, of course, there's consequences to your choices, but he ultimately wants all his children to come to the truth. So how will they come to the truth? Who will show them? It's supposed to be us Christians. But where is the love? Where is the desire to save souls and lead the lost to Jesus? If you genuinely believe you have the truth and someone else doesn't, instead of tearing them down and mocking them, think, 
What can I do to help them, to save them? God may want to use you to teach them. Let your light shine before others so God may be glorified. Jesus is coming soon. Instead of this boasty, yeah, I'm good, I'm holier than thou, I know better than you attitude. You're wrong, I'm right, I'm so wise, no one can teach me nothing because I know everything. Can we have love? Can we have humility? Can we remember what Christ came to do? Can we remember what he wants us to do and how to do it? The enemy is at work within our churches. So there was a non adventist woman telling the truth about the SDA church. The SDA church is not a cult. You know, we are the remnants of this end time. The church is the remnant church. And uh, we are described in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. You know, but do you know the reason why many non-Avenists actually label the SDA church as a cult? Friends, they have agenda and I'm going to share this with you. The reason is that they want to prevent people from joining the SDA church, let me say, from joining God's church. So they think that by labeling the church as a cult, people are not going to come to church or people are not going to join the SDA church. But friends, <laughs> they have failed. They have failed. And how do I know what I just said? It came from their own mouth, friends. It came from their own mouth. And uh, we are going to listen to them right now. Why they label the SDA church a cult. Let's watch this. So I think that everyone present in this room can agree that Seventh-day Adventism is a growing problem. Over 22 million members worldwide as of last June, and some other statistics to give you some context. In 2021, there were just over a million accessions. I assume most of you know what that means. That, that means new members, converts. That does not include births. Over a million. That averages out to one accession every 30 seconds or so. One new congregation every 3.62 hours. And at the same time, and I'm sure this will also be of interest to you, in 2021, there were almost 800,000 losses, which equals people leaving. That does not include deaths. Over the past 15 years, the rate of net losses is about 42%. Is that something to celebrate? Or, in truth, are many of these people, perhaps even most, adventized and spiritually damaged and confused and in need of rescue themselves, even though they have walked away? Now, for me as a missionary, and, and Richard alluded to this, I take special note of the following numbers. In 2021, the top 20 countries in terms of Adventist membership make up, made up nearly 75% of the world total. Three quarters in just 20 countries. 11 of those top 20 countries are in Sub-Saharan Africa. And amazingly, those 11 countries, their membership makes up nearly 40% of the world total. So my real world challenge, my day-to-day -day challenge, is I help believers in Kenya and Uganda and Zambia and Malawi and so forth, is how can we best persuade Christians in Africa that Adventism is so biblically unsound that its false teachings need to be firmly rejected and its followers need to be evangelized. Because Adventism has a rather high reputation in these countries where it is so well established and growing at such a clip. You see, I've learned in a 40 some years of going to Eastern Southern Africa, lay African Christians don't do nuance well. They just want to know, is it true or is it false? Is it a cult or isn't it? And not a lot in between is satisfying to them. Now, we have a problem because Adventism is the duckbill platypus of Christianity. 
It defies easy categorization. And Adventist attitudes toward us, what do you call it? Is it schizophrenia? Is it gaslighting? Uh, you know, one minute they want to sing Kumbaya with all the Protestants, and the next minute, they're the remnant church of Bible prophecy, and Sunday worship is the mark of the beast observed by Babylon and her harlot daughters. <laughs> Which is it to be? Depends, doesn't it? Which brings me to a dilemma that we face sometimes, not only in Africa, but here in the United States. How do we best label this growing problem called Adventism? Because whatever label we choose, we want to be taken seriously by two distinct audiences. Outsiders, which is to say non-Adventists, in which case our objective is to warn and explain. And Adventists, in which case our objective is to evangelize. As a practical matter for the purposes of this talk, I want to focus on persuading outsiders, that is, uninformed and frequently skeptical Christians. What label do we use? Option one, denomination. Even most Adventists seem to be just fine with this. Definitely not an inflammatory word. Option number two, new religious movement. Not widely applied to the Adventists, as it seems rather improbable. 169 years old equals new. But scholars such as Irving Hexham have used it. This too is not inflammatory. It might have someone scratching their heads, but they won't get angry. Option three, sect. From the Latin secta, meaning party or school or faction. Not flattering, but also not inflammatory. Option four, the C word, <laughs> cult. It's, it's, it's better with just a, a little bit of, you know, cult. Well, this word is almost always inflammatory, prompting either curiosity or outright hostility. It's a loaded word. It's best used with discretion and restraint. It can come across as mean-spirited and harsh and intended to cause injury. Kind of a verbal weapon. And bear in mind that popular everyday use of the word cult is largely based on two perceptions, deviance and harm. Deviance as in, this group looks offbeat, unconventional, a little unsettling, maybe creepy. Harm. This group is capable of dangerous things, and I don't want to be there when they happen. So, just to help you imagine this a little better, in relation to using cult to describe Adventism, picture this conversation with me and a skeptical Christian. Now, if those are our operational definitions of cult and heresy, then mm, Seventh-day Adventism is a, as a theological system is a clear candidate. But again, to repeat, using the word cult Label Adventism can easily alienate both of the audiences we ostensibly want to persuade. So friends, you heard that the SDA church is a problem according to what he said. And uh, they are labeling the SDA church just to alienate people from the church. But as I said earlier, they have failed. They have failed because the church is God's church. You know, and I don't know why they have problem with the SDA church. Friends, <laughs> I don't know why they always have problem with the church. But I'm sure the reason why they have problem with the church is because we have the truth. Because we preach the truth. And also, it is recorded in the books of prophecy, especially in the book of Revelation that the devil is going to be angry with the rest of her offspring, uh, those who keep the commandments of God and hold on to the faith or testimony of Jesus Christ. And who are those? The Seventh-day Adventist. Seventh-day Adventist. And the church, friends, 
the church, the SDA church, because we are the only church that keeps the commandment. I mean the whole Ten Commandments, not the Catholic commandment, but the biblical commandments of God. And also hold fast the faith, friends, the faith that saves. So it hurts them, you know, they are feeling kind of bad, but you cannot actually feel bad for something that is true. Mm -hmm. So friends, we read from Revelation, Revelation chapter 12 verse 17 and it says, and the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So friends, it is no surprise that these men out there are making war with the church. They are trying to label the church as a cult just to prevent people from knowing the truth, from entering the church, from being part of God's remnant people. But the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. Friends, the devil is a liar. And you know, the more they do this, the more people get to know the truth about the remnant church. The more people get to know the truth about the Sabbath, the truth about the commandments of God the more people get to know the truth and friends the number of people that are joining the SDA church just go see it for yourself yes just go see it for yourself just go um to um, google and uh, search for png 2024 and see the number of people that have joined god's church day in and day out people are joining god's church not because of anything but because of the truth because of the truth the bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free people want to be freed from the errors in those churches so friends if you are a seventh day Adventist, be proud of yourself like be, be thankful to God that you have seen the light. Be thankful to God that you are part of the remnants. Be thankful to God, friends. So let us keep our faith. No matter what the devil does, it's not going to stand. It's not going to stand because nowhere in the Bible does it say that the dragon overcame the, um, the rest of the offspring. Nowhere do you find that in the Bible. But we know that, friends, Jesus Christ overcame him on the cross. So the devil has already been defeated. Friends, this is all that I had to share with you today. My name is Lawrence. Thanks for watching. See you next time. God bless.